And now, it's time for Mob Talk Radio with your host, Jeff Canarsi. Hey, welcome back to Mob Talk Radio. At this point, we are going to talk about the waterfront a little bit, as we've been talking for a couple of weeks. Uh, the majority of what I've been trying to do is just sort of teach you guys a bit of how the waterfront works. And today, you're going to see uh, some. You're going to hear something towards the end of this that that I think is going to surprise you. Uh, and it's about Tommy Bellotti, believe it or not. A lot of people have always sort of thought that Tommy Bellotti was just some sort of chauffeur for Paul Castellano and was kind of not a big mob guy and just kind of got the, the sort of the, it was, you know, got the, the underboss position just by happenstance. And that's not really the case. I mean, Tommy Bellotti was a tough fucking guy. Uh, he was a, he was a respected guy. To, and, and I think history is sort of, uh, morphed who he is because of, of what happened, uh, outside of spark steakhouse. Uh, and there's a reason why Tommy Bellotti gets killed. And, and you have to look logistically at what's the reason why when Gotti says, this is what we're going to do, why is Bellotti killed? Because they could have just shot and killed Paul Castellano and left it at that. And then just said, by the way, we're taking over. But they don't do that. They kill Bellotti. And they kill Bellotti because a uh, similar situation to Vito Genovese uh, and Carlo Gambino and and, and uh, Neil Della Croce is that when Carlo feared that Neil would take retribution, this was the same exact thing. If they're going to get rid of everybody, everybody in the Castellano regime's got to go. Uh, so for those that think that Bellotti was just like a, a fucking nobody, uh, would be seriously, seriously wrong. Uh, so last week we talked about Unirac uh, and investigations and stuff like that. Uh, and, and Unirac was a very successful you know, uh, operation that was, uh, well, let's see, thinking of a better way to sort of describe this. Um, so, uh, so once there was the Unirac investigation, okay, uh, law enforcement intelligence, you know, gathered uh, a lot of different intel. Uh, and, and the government, you know, after sort of all of those investigations, uh, the mob sort of switched up how they were running things and, and the government would lose a lot of opportunities to maintain pressure on the waterfront because they essentially resorted to civil measures uh, that, you know, more or less corrupt ILA structures uh, were under attack uh, because of Unirac uh, indictments and, and convictions. <laughs> So there was a lot of, you know, different stuff that was going on at the time period. Uh, and, and so there was something called the Landrum Griffin Act. And what that does is that bars convicted union officers from holding union office. Uh, a management official equally guilty of willing to, willing to take bribes or kickbacks uh, usually continues in the same company position once released from prison or even while in jail. So in other words... Even if a guy is the the, the head of a union or a head of a uh, or has some standing in a union or controls some part of the ports, even after the fact that they've been convicted, uh, they get out and go right back to what their position was. And there's really there was really no way that the government could stop it. And the relationships between the ILA union offices or officers and the employers was uh, always beneficial. Okay, and that's that's why it went on. It was always beneficial for kickbacks and et cetera. So some convicted union 
officers went back to the ports working for industries closely associated with the port, and that basically enabled them to circumvent the provisions of the Landrum Griffin Act. So in other words, if you're a felon, you cannot be in a position of power on the docks, but the mob found a way to circumvent that. Uh, Anthony Anastasio, for example, who was a former high-ranking IOA official who got convicted along with Anthony Scotto, had worked for a marine engine repair company. Now, because of his organized crime connections and the grip on the industry that he and the family exercised in the past, even this direct indirect association with the port may be cause for problems. So even if he doesn't come back out and take that position, off the record, he's still taking the position. So there's no real way despite the infiltration of the unions that the FBI could do everything in the world, uh, but, but sit on Pinocchio's face and they can't change it because even though the, the Landrum Griffin act states that they can't hold a position fine, they put somebody else in the position, but then tough Tony Anastasio still off the record is controlling it. So there was really nothing they can do. Uh, and, and I hope I'm making that clear because even if you have places or, or things that are sort of, enacted to prevent this from happening there's so many ways to get around it now here's what i want all of you to do if you're interested in the waterfront type in new york new new york city new jersey war on the waterfront uh that should bring up an article uh because currently new york and newark are fighting each other right now they're threatening to sue each other because of how bad uh the ports are and and just some of the union shit that's going on it's insane it's an insane read and they've been going back and forth for months Anyway, um, so there was one instance where an individual had been convicted, returned as a service provider to the same health and welfare fund in which he had been associated. So at least 34 of the 117 people that were convicted as a result of the UNIRAC indictment returned to the industry either indirectly or in some sort of direct capacity uh, and sort of as a, a postscript to uh, UNIRAC, uh, ILA President Teddy Gleason protested that the ILA was unable to prevent or discover criminal activities by its officials. What may be noticed is that the two groups of officials in two ports failed their duty. They have been proceeded against and are now under sanction. This is uh, this as well as it should be. This is direct statement from them. The suggested uh, failure of the union and myself to discover and correct the situation early on must be matched against the sophisticated five-year investigation of the Department of Justice and the expense of millions of dollars, which is necessary to develop cases against these individuals. So the ILA, as far as like in 1983, uh, the ILA consisted, and this is, keep in mind, this is 1983, so this may be a little different now. Uh, the ILA consisted of 272 American 30 Canadian locals with total membership approximately 69,000 men and women, approximately 50%, 55% of the membership in the IOA's peak year, 1968, was 125,000 members. At the end of the calendar year in 1983, the union had net assets valued at 28 million nine hundred and eighty one six eight five and cash receipts in s in excess of 50 million dollars the structure of the ila uh is is such that the principal offers of local excuse me principal officers of local unions are also officers of the international during the year ending in december of 83 the international expended one million five hundred twenty eight thousand seven hundred one dollars in gross salaries one hundred twenty two thousand five hundred ninety five in allowances and ninety five thousand four hundred forty one in reimbursed expenses for a total disbursement to officers of one million seven hundred forty six thousand seven hundred thirty seven dollars the ila structure allows an interlocking directorate of individuals who are paid, you know basically paid beyond belief there was a computer analysis uh, of salaries and disbursements for the international and the New York District Council, Council, the Atlantic Coast District and 12 locals conducted at the commission's request by the Department of Labor indicates that 42 individuals occupy 
you're going to laugh when I tell you this, and I hope you can, I'm not speaking too much jargon for you, but it indicates that 42 individuals occupy 97 union official positions. Some officers hold as many as four different positions. So what they're doing is they're monopolizing the salaries. 10 officers received in excess of $100,000 from union uh, from several union entities where they hold official positions, as well as reimbursement for expenses and allowances, which appears to be no more than a simple additional salary. For example, Donald Carson held four union positions in 1983 and received over $179,000 from all four in salary, allowances, and expenses. Uh, similarly, uh, Jay Coloza received over $146,000 in salary allowances and expenses for three positions that he occupied. In early 1985, the commission staff conducted interviews at the ports of New York, New Jersey, and Miami, and Virginia to assess the present state of racketeering activities on the waterfront and to investigate the activities of those who were convicted as a result of the UNIRAC investigation. Uh, that any racketeering in these few in these ports had a nationwide impact is demonstrated easily and convincingly by the value of its cargo going in and out of these ports. For example, during 1982, the port of New York, New Jersey, uh, processed 42 billion dollars worth of ocean-borne freight, five billion more than the nation's second-ranking port. With respect to the North Atlantic ports. The port of New York, New Jersey's share of ocean-borne general cargoes increased between 81 and 82 from 45.8% to 47.3%. Uh, finally, the port of Newark, New York, uh, and Norfolk handled more than twice as much containerized cargo in 1982 as the next ranking port in excess of 19% of all containerized cargo nationwide. So, Let's look at the port of New York and New Jersey. Like ILA, uh, excuse me, like ILA membership nationwide, ILA, excuse me, ILA membership in the port of New York, New Jersey has also sort of steadily declined. At one time, union membership was an excess of 20,000. So in 1985, the membership is, it was hovering right about 11,000. Even though many of the current members of the New York, New Jersey ILA locals do not work full-time on piers, they receive guaranteed annual income under the contract now that's in effect. Management agreed to guaranteed annual income in return for union acceptance of automation and for a reduction in crews from 21 to 18 longshoremen. Uh, PCOC's investigation into the IOA unions associated with New York Harbor indicates that locals 1814 and 1814 1, which are run by Gambino crime family, uh, remain firmly under control of the Gambino and Genovese crime families. And while the Gambino family controls completely the international union, the officers convicted in Unirac have been replaced, but the system remains in place. Joe Kenny. Uh, related to former 1804 president who was part of James Cashin's group, is now president of the 1804-1, as well as the secretary treasurer of ILA's New York District Council and international vice president. Unirac convicted racketeers, <coughs> James Cashin uh, and Thomas Bazanka, each have been rewarded with a lifetime annuity of 12000 or excuse me, $25,012 from the local. George Barone, another convicted racketeer, also receives a lifetime annuity of $22,516. So they get that for the rest of their fucking life. These annuities are paid from a general union funds and are in addition to the monies that Cashin, Bazanka, and Barone will receive from the ILA pension fund. Now you would think, if you're convicted of racketeering, you should lose your pension funds, but that's not the way this works. So despite all the success of the Unirac, uh, of Unirac, the Genovese crime family continues to maintain a firm hold on the New Jersey waterfront through one ILA leader. Uh, this is a series of conversations that were intercepted from the FBI between 81 and 82 uh, in the office of a member of the Genovese crime family. And it illustrates the mob's control, continued influence on the ILA and the shipping industry. Uh, this particular member made it clear to the ILA International Vice President that the vice presidents in the New Jersey waterfront were owned by the Genovese crime family. And there's not a name because it's redacted, but member. 
Uh, I found on the waterfront, nobody has it but me. I won't give it to nobody. I'm the only guy in the fucking mob. I'm not going to give it to nobody. And I'm not going to give it to anybody because they're going to abuse it. <coughs> that same member discussed how the union officials should conduct himself in public. Remember, you got to stop your drinking, pal. You got a good position here. I don't want you to act. Fucking act like a little baby in front of your men. I don't care about guys who go out and the fucking shit laying the fucking broads. Vice president says, you don't, gotta, you don't have to tell me this. Member says, your men see when you're fucking drinking. And you know what the fuck uh, you're saying. And you don't know what the fuck you're saying and what the fuck you're doing. You're somebody now. I don't want to put, I don't want to put, I don't want you to embarrass us, the vice president. I, I did embarrass myself. I, I know. I'm sorry. <clears throat> and so the con conversation goes, vice president of the ILA, all we have to do is knock him off. There's no other way to do it. Uh, they don't ever concern their, They don't ever concern themselves with the annuity payments. They can get it. They can get it. There's no way in hell that I'm going to let them get it. Member says, I don't care about that. Look, look. The vice president says, you just tell me what you want me to do. The member who's a member of the mob says, look, look. Vice president, knock this off where, you know, what do you want me to do? Member says, I don't know. That's a job for Bobby. Uh, finally, the member discusses payoffs demanded by the mob. Vice president, uh, what Bert told me. Member, oh, yeah, tell me about that. Vice president, he says, I don't know. He's supposed to be 335 coming, you know, I don't know, coming here. Member, 3500 Vice President, a month. He says, uh, you give this to George, and George is supposed to, you know, give whatever. Remember, one third of whatever, this is important, one third of whatever they're paying you, I told you that a long time ago. That's what gets kicked. One third of whatever the fuck you're paying. So there you go. You're realizing he's got to pay one third of whatever he's bringing in. So the presidency of Local 1814 passed. Uh, from convicted racketeer Anthony Scotto to Frank Leonardo. Leonardo is uh, a mob guy who is related to uh, Anthony Anastasio. Uh, I believe he was married to, if I remember correctly, uh, he was related to Anthony Anastasio by marriage, same as Anthony Scotto was. So prior to assuming the presidency of 1814, Leonardo was the administrator of the ILA's Health and Welfare, Welfare Fund, as well as the Metropolitan Marine Maintenance Container Association. He was paid 19, almost, almost $20,000 a year as an administrative assistant to local 1814 under Anthony Scotto. Uh, in the latter part of 1980, after Scotto's conviction, Leonardo was appointed the executive board, not elected, but appointed to the presidency of 1814, and in 1981 received a salary of $132,294. A review of the reports filed by the local with the Department of Labor indicate that 21 of 23 officers in 1983 also had served during Anthony Scotto's reign. So they're just packing their people in. Uh, several individuals convicted of labor racketeering in the Port of New York and New Jersey have returned to the point and other, uh, other than union capacities, perpetuating the influence of organized crime at the port, notwithstanding the success of UNIRAC. For example, Anthony Anastasio, who has been employed uh, by the Maritime Employees Benevolent Association, which is a union, as a researcher since his release from prison. Anastasio has been an officer of the Nodar Pump Repair Company, an entity which does business with the shipping industry. Uh, it's not regulated by the Waterfront Commission because it is locate, located more than a thousand yards in the port. So here's proof that even after they're convicted, they come back to the port in some sort of capacity. Uh, Tom, Thomas Bazanka, former officer of Local 1804-1, is a sales representative for Ozonite Chemicals, which supplies industrial chemicals to the shipping industry. Uh, Ozonite Chemicals is owned by Jimmy Cashin, the father of Patrick Cashin, who was a welfare director of the Metropolitan Marine Maintenance Container Association. Vinny Marino, who was the former president of the Marine Repair Service, is still active in the port, still active in the ports outside of the New York, New Jersey area from which he is barred. So, so the whole point about bringing up uh, the act that we talked about earlier is: once you're convicted of shit like that, you can't be in the ports. So, in most cases. 
the mob can't bring their guys back and put them in leadership positions, but they'll throw up a, a front boss leadership position, if, if you can follow my logic here. And if they can't even do that, then they find a way to bring them right back to the port. So everything the FBI and the Department of Justice and the labor unions have always tried to do, they can't win. So traditionally, as we said before, uh, the Genovese crime family through local 1804, uh, excuse me, 1804-1 ran uh, the Manhattan and New Jersey waterfronts, while the Gambino family through 1814 had the Brooklyn waterfront. Uh, and there appears to be just kind of one, uh, one sort of exception um, to the boundary. In 1979, Brewer Dry Dock Company, then located in Staten Island, New York, was sold to Jackson Engineering Company, which moved its operations to New Jersey. Jackson then signed a collective bargaining agreement with the IOE Local 1814, even though its employees had long been represented by Local 17 of the Marine and Shipbuilding Workers Union of America, Jackson's employees received reduced wages while the company paid off Anthony Scotto, who then was president of Local 1814. So Jackson Engineering was really the first instance of an IOA local representing dry dock employees, as well as the first sort of incursion into local 1814 into New Jersey. The significance of, of that event is, is the precedent that they have set for the ILA representation of dry dock workers for the future. So they're setting it up for the future and for perhaps the new U S Naval base to be established on Staten Island. So as you can see, <coughs> they evolve uh, most states, uh, believe it or not, do have, don't have the type of licensing authority, but New York and New Jersey does. And they've established in their waterfront commission to bar employers from operating on the waterfront. However, there are limitations uh, in the, the bi-state compact that established the waterfront commission in 1953, which have kept it from being successful as it might be. So, for example... Uh, container repair companies and shipping management companies that conduct their businesses more than a thousand yards from an active pier are not covered by the Waterfront Commission's investigative or licensing authority. In addition, employer organizations are excluded from coverage. Uh, only active peers are covered by that compact, although so-called inactive peers are still used by ships for tie downs and repairs. So because union labor is used in those activities outside the coverage of the compact, many opportunities could exist for extortion kickbacks and the use of what I love to call ghost employees and the assignment of the longshoremen to these inactive peers. In addition, the Waterfront Commission lacks the authority to license all entities involved in the movement of waterborne cargo. So, you know, Throughout the years, there's been a lot of technological change and, and, and stuff like that. But, um, you know, uh, but just like I always tell you, the, the mafia finds a way to evolve. So, um, you know, uh, with the creation of new port facilities, uh, you know, there would be new uh, seaport facilities built and the old ones would just kind of be abandoned but there would be people like anthony scotto who would take advantage of that which gave the gambino crime family a monopoly on brooklyn's docks and gave anthony scotto a significant portion of the container repair business on staten island in the late 1960s the ila members consisted of deep what they call deep sea labor uh, container maintenance and repairmen, uh, warehousemen, and the latter represented the bulk of the membership. Despite fewer numbers, deep sea labor, which offloaded bulk cargo, provided the leverage for extortion by organized crime by preventing shippers from unloading their cargo, uh, changed that. The container maintenance and repair trades now provided organized crime a stranglehold on the industry. You know, initially it was believed that container port uh, facilitates or excuse me, container port facilities could be successful only if they were situated on large tracts of land, little of which was available in Manhattan, Brooklyn, or Hoboken. The Port Authority of New York elected to develop a container point at Howland Hook, uh, Staten Island, in Port Elizabeth, New Jersey. Under Anthony Scotto, Local 1814 saw its power base diminishing because cargo began to be shipped by container through uh by container through facilities at which local 1814 apparently had no presence. 
since so in other words they were moving where the ships were going and because the gambinos didn't control that area they didn't have any oversight since deep sea labor was not essential to the unloading process Local 1814 has grown larger by absorbing other ILA pocket locals in, on Brooklyn Piers. So in this way, 1814's membership expanded to include container repairmen, riggers, and warehousemen, and hence obtained entry into the container trade. Uh, as a volume of container cargo through Staten Island and Port Elizabeth increased, the ILA in Staten Island Local 920, which consisted mainly of deep-sea labor, was forced to turn to Anthony Scotto, 1814, to find jobs. So they're absorbing it. So we're not over in this area. So what we're going to do is we're going to combine with a couple of other unions that aren't recognized, and we're going to push our way into that. Uh, as the container segment of the industry increased, convicted uh, uh, racketeer Vinnie Marino made a small investment in a container repair company known as Marine Repair Services. The company then becomes highly profitable because of the businesses were steered to it from specific peers in Brooklyn and Staten Island. During this time, uh, Gambino crime family captain Tommy Bellotti, who was also a convicted felon at the time, ostensibly was employed at Marine Repair and a facility located uh, over 1,000 yards from the nearest active pier. In this way, Bellotti was able to circumvent the Waterfront, Waterfront Commission regulations, which excluded convicted felons from employment to be one, within 1,000 yards of an active pier. Now, you would think that the feds or the Department of Justice and Labor would move in and say, okay, let's just get rid of that rule. Let's just make it two miles. You know what I mean? But the mob would always find a way around that. Uh, so, you know, organ, organized crime has continued to uh, to really show that they're advanced with technological innovation, uh, especially when it comes to the waterfront. In the early 1970s, for example, uh, as finger piers on Manhattan's conventional docks were closing down, the Howland Hook Terminal on Staten Island uh, emerged as one of the East Coast premier container facilities. Uh, before the sort of advent of containerization in the Metropolitan Marine Maintenance Container Association, which is the MMMCA, uh, had been its uh, incorporation in 1947, uh, an insignificant trade association. The importance of MMMCA, however, increased with the expansion of containerization and the growing prominence of Howland Hook. So the MMCA's purpose is to promote and regulate maintenance, ship repair, and cleaning, as well as general longshore and maritime work on the piers. Over the years, the functions have increased to include lashing and cargo container repair work. Its activities have generally been restricted to the ports in New York and New Jersey. The MMMCA uh, acts on behalf of its management associate members in contract negotiations with various ILA locals. Uh, membership based solely on a decision reached by the MMMCA CA executive board entitles a company to labor from ILA locals 1814 and 1804, which is Gambino run. The MMMCA is also entrusted with the administration of various union pension, welfare, and other benefit funds on behalf of his associate members and the members of the ILA. The revenue for the administration of the funds is generated through assessments made against each member of the association and based on the collective bargaining agreement with the ILA. All funds are administered, at least in part, by the MMMCA. Those are which jointly administered by the MMMCA and the ILA have designated representatives of the MMMCA and the ILA assigned to each one of those funds. All right, so in 1975, the MMMCA's collective bargaining agreement with the union required member companies to contribute to the MMMCA 2%, 2% of all gross earnings of workers to cover administrative costs and the employees' benefit funds. 2% of everything that you made went to something else. Can you believe that? Uh, the MMMCA claims to be tax, a tax-exempt corporation for the federal income tax purposes. Its reported income consisting of the 2% surcharge paid by the container industry has annually brought in over $900,000 a year. Since 1975, MMMCA... Mama, mama, 
MMMCA members have been faced with the choice presented by the contract itself of making the 2% payments or being denied labor from the Gambino and Genovese family influenced ILA workers. So it's either pay your fucking 2% or guess what? You're not going to fucking work. Uh, The collective bargaining agreement between the ILA and the MMMCA provides for informing the entire industry uh, that a member company has not lived up to the agreement, including a payment of 2% surcharges with the following words. Any contractor who has signed this master agreement who does not live up to the terms of this agreement shall be declared and considered by reason thereof to be non-union. And the union... Uh, shall have the right to publish to other contractors and the shipping industry generally with such facts. So in other words, if you don't do what we fucking tell you, we're going to put your names in a form and let everybody fucking know so you won't be hired by anybody. So it's a shakedown. The union agrees that the association shall not sign any agreement with any with any advantage over another contractor signed to this master agreement. So the provision ties the hands of non-MMMCA members in the type of agreements that they can negotiate with the ILA. Even non-member companies cannot do business under the terms of more favorable uh, than those set by the ILA in the MMMCA. So in practice, any company which the MMMCA declares to be non-union has little prospect of doing business in the port of New Jersey or New York. Um, So in 1975, the Employee Retirement Income Security Act, ERISA, becomes becomes effective. Uh, ERISA can reaffirm that federal law long existing obligations of trust imposed by labor trust fund trustees and managers, the highest known to the law. ERISA uh, ERISA also requires labor organization trust funds to make uh, annual public disclosures of their financial operations. ERISA permits the Secretary of Labor to take action to preserve the integrity of each trust fund. Uh, intentional diversion of the ERISA fund assets may be prosecuted as a criminal or considered criminal embezzlement. Normally, the expenses of fund administration are bored by the pension and welfare funds directly. Administrative expenses can be used as a means to siphon off fund contributions intended to be used to pay benefits to two union members. So, in 1981, MMMCA, with approval from the ILA, uh, basically altered the nature of the 2% charge for administering the employee's benefit fund. The new agreement continued to require a contribution of 2% of all employees' salaries covered by the agreement, but is now characterized in this fund as unrelated to the benefit funds by the uh, expedient of dropping the phrase employee benefit funds and creating a separate management administrative fund. The MMMCA may have sought to avoid the liabilities and controls of ERISA. So they're getting right around uh, the employee retirement income security act. So they're finding a way around that. This labeling of integral uh, operational functions of the MMMCA's trust funds may have been an, an attempt to shield the disposition of administrative fund contributions from the ERISA scrutiny since MMMCA has taken the position that the management of the administrative fund is not covered by e- the by any ERISA fiduciary obligations. So they're just trying to get around Uh, all kinds of things. Finally, the MMMCA and the local union of which it has been bargaining have very close ties through blood blood relationships and employee exchanges. Uh, Bert Guido, who was a president of the MMMCA directly or indirectly controls through financial interests, a high percentage of many maintenance companies doing business in New York's Harbor. The two executive directors of the MMMCA, Thomas Eagleton and Robert Calaza, have close working relationships with ILA locals 1804 and 1814. Convicted racketeer James Cash and son Patrick was MMMCA welfare director. Frank Leonardo, the current president of local 1814, was MMMCA pension director. John Anastasio, former vice president of local 1814 and the son of Anthony Anastasio, replaced Frank Leonardo 
as MMMCA Pension Director Joe Colaza, then Vice President of Local 1814-2, uh, was former director of the MMMCA ILA Pension Fund. He's the brother of Robert Colaza, the president of MMMCA Executive Director. Since Unirac, MMMCA has continued its operations and even increased its responsibilities in the area of health uh, and welfare fund administration. So everybody's related to everybody. So the MMMCA operates uh, in an industry with a long history of influence by organized crime, which is a blurred distinction really between management and labor uh, and the interchangeability of personnel, which uh, obviously we know is by blood or by organized crime family ties. So while it's sort of circumstantial in terms of what we're talking about, uh, really the telltale signs of the mob's presence was confirmed uh, when the FBI intercepted a conversation involving Paul Castellano uh, and Tommy Bellotti. Uh So this happened, oh, and Tommy Gambino, Carlo Gambino's son. Uh, so in 1983, there was a bug that intercepted a conversation uh, and Castellano was basically uh, explaining that in his first year of uh, the Longshore, uh, the, in the first year, the Longshoremen's Union was theirs, the Genovese crime family. We, the Gambino family, had Brooklyn. Carlo Gambino once suggested to Castellano to give the international presidency to Anthony Scotto. Bellotti then raised the issue of the beef with Metro Marine, and the following conversation began. Tommy Bellotti, they made a uh, they made a split they made a split that time with the Metro, but everything in Jersey and New York moved over to Staten Island. Paul Castellano, because I made this, I made this law, but all of a sudden that gave they they they, they split it up. So finally, I marked it up. Half's for me, the Gambinos, and half is for the Genovese crime family. They took over there. Anthony Scotto, he took it all for himself, the fucking cocksucker. Uh, this and other intercepted conversations disclosed an essential difference in the roles of Bellotti and Scotto in influencing the docs for the Gambino crime family. Scotto was Castellano's approved choice for the presidency. Castellano said, we respected him. It was our union. We were making his advance in our union. Go up, 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 and go up the ladder. And what it was, it is what it is. What's going to happen? We were going to have a president. We would control everything. Uh, and, you know, it just goes to show that while Paul went with what Carlo Gambino wanted, he was also very bitter about Scotto because Scotto took things for himself. But because what it really comes down to is Castellano wanted to put Bellotti in as president. He really wanted to do that because he felt like he could trust Bellotti more and he could really wield and exert all the control he wanted but with Anthony Scotto he really couldn't do that so he had regrets about putting Scotto uh in in, in charge but uh the Unirac investigation pretty much derailed uh you know Castellano's presidential aspirations for Anthony Scotto because uh Bellotti's role on behalf of the Gambino family was to protect the new containerization jobs at Howland Hook from encroachment by local 1804 and the Genovese crime family. So basically, he was trying to put Bellotti in to stop the Genovese from trying to encroach on their territory. So to resolve the issue, Bellotti actually had a meeting with George Barone, Jimmy Cashin, and Doug Rago, uh, who, you know, it was a sit down over who's going to control what. So despite Castellano's support for Anthony Scotto, though, Scotto's entry into the Staten Island pier business threatened this rapprochement between the Genovese and Gambino crime families, which depended on respect for Castellano for his success. Castellano knew that with Anthony Scotto, you always had the bargain, which led Castellano to tell him, Tony, the sooner we stop this, it threatens the other thing just in terms of everything. So apparently when the FBI and Unirac, uh, they put Scotto out of business, this revolved, uh, excuse me, resolved a different internal or uh, problem with Castellano because the, the, the Genovese people weren't going to respect Castellano. He thought putting Bellotti in uh, would help, but it only made it worse. But because Anthony Scotto had designs, not for himself, so to speak, but because he's, you know, going to run the presidency and he's going to control everything. Castellano was a greedy fuck. 
He wanted everything for himself. And Scotto was willing to negotiate and willing to bargain by saying, listen, you guys get this this amount. The Genovese gets, gets some of this amount. It's all good. Everybody will be happy. But that's not what Castellano wanted. He did not want a guy just like he just said. Uh, where's the... Um, uh, where's the, where's the, uh, quote, hold on. Uh, with, a, with Anthony Scotto, you, you, he, he, he always just wants to bargain. You know, the, the sooner we stop allowing it to bargain, it's just going to threaten everything in terms of everything. So it's Castellano bitching that why are they bargaining with the, with the Genovese crime family? They shouldn't be, they should be telling them what to do, not bargaining. But Scotto was smart enough to know let's just why make headaches so it just goes to show and it's a, a sort of another notch that castellano was a greedy fuck there was more than enough room for everybody you know um and so what ended up happening was scotto gets removed from a position which permitted him to receive kickbacks not sanctioned by paul castellano and the arrangement between genovese and gambino families was effectively somewhat secured. So the minute that that Anthony Scotto was done, uh, you know, he was taking kickbacks that were not sanctioned by Paul Castellano, and it was aggravating uh, the Genovese crime family. And yeah, by 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 my own admission, I mean he shouldn't have been doing that, and and Paul Castellano would have had every reason to to, to sort of be upset about that. Uh, but at the end of the day. Business is business, and, and once Scotto is sort of removed, Castellano gets whatever he wants because now he can attempt to control everything. Uh, so, apart from the MMMCA, traditional waterfront corruption uh, would just continue. Uh, jobs would continue to be sold on the waterfront, and that sort of reflects, you know, nothing but organized crime and corruption. Non-union members have paid as much as almost three thousand dollars to be allowed to use the union card of a member who is not currently working in the industry turf ownership is integrated at the ports with vendors paying those in control to sell their products even though that pay or even though that they may be improperly licensed by the city to sell on public property loan shark and gambling and bribes to obtain jobs are still 100 pre uh, pre prevalent in the port of new york and new jersey false invoices reflecting movement of non-existent containers uh which show companies are charged uh, by owner operators for the movement of containers that the company itself transported are used to generate money for payoffs. Further investigations also revealed that several stevedore and dock employee dock employees earn between seventy to one hundred thousand dollars a year. These are high paid workers that are close associates of union officials and organized crime figures to help main control, maintain control and enforcement for organized criminal activities in the port. So. 1950 what did i say 1956 there was an agreement between new york and new jersey that's what they're fighting about right now in politics that's what they're arguing about that's why i wanted to get into the waterfront because a lot of people are like what are they fighting over i don't understand it's like a a 100 year agreement well maybe a 100 year agreement but they're fighting now and so one of the things i wanted to show was paul castellano's sort of hold uh versus anthony scotto listen no matter who you ask, no matter who you run into, Anthony Scotto was a gem of a fucking guy, but he controlled the docks like nobody's business, and he made the Gambino crime family billions of dollars. But it wasn't enough for Paul Castellano. He wanted to put Tommy Bellotti in charge of everything because he felt like Anthony Scotto was too much of a bargainer, too much of a guy that would go back and forth with everybody. And listen, don't get me wrong. Scotto taking illegal kickbacks without Paul's blessing. Okay, that's a problem, but they all do that. So that's nothing new. So you can't like hold that against him and say, well, you know, Paul had a right to be that way. Well, he really didn't. He really didn't. Uh, and, and it just really emphasizes more of Paul Castellano's greed. Uh, and, and this is just the docs. And so we talk all the time on this show about racketeer and loan shark and the numbers racket and narcotics. The docs is a fucking infinite way to make money. It's an infinite way. And so when we talk about how much crime families' net worths are, uh, look at Anthony Salerno on his own by himself worth over a billion dollars. So when the, the, the FBI says over the years, well, the Gambinos were pulling in $400 million a year. That's, that's a low number to me because they could probably pull in five, 10, 20, $30 million a year just off the docks alone. Never mind narcotics, numbers, loan shark, and bookmaking, theft. You know, and 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 
I think the docs initially, when Lucky Luciano is is sort of setting everything up, you know, I don't I don't know if if, if Lucky Luciano was ingenious enough to understand that down the line there would be unions and 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 how the corruption would act, or or how they could facilitate that corruption. So it's like the old narrative is that you go into a bread store and you're going to shake the bread store guy down. You're going to say, okay, you charge 30 cents a loaf for bread. You're going to charge it 40. I'm going to take five off every loaf. And in terms of that, nobody's going to fuck with you. Your, your deliveries are going to be on time. No matter what, we're always going to get them to you and nobody's going to walk in here to fuck with you now to over, to overflow that five cent kickback. He's going to raise it another five cents to get it back. So only, only society charges for that. We're the ones that are paying the extra kick up for it. And that's the way the mafia functions in general, in a very small level, uh, everything from, uh, you know, look at what's going on in the country now with like oil. Can you imagine if the mafia had a stranglehold on gas and oil coming in from overseas, if they, if, if, if oil didn't come from the Middle East and it came from Italy, do you have any idea the amount of fucking money the mob would be taken from that? And, and just on the small scale of using sort of the bread, the, 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 the bread sort of scenario or the example is that how, that's how the mob does things. It's like, I always say, you know how every, every year, every state seems to come out with what the minimum uh, sort of yearly income you should have to be able to live and live okay. Uh, so a lot of people bitch all the time and they say, well, you know, a fucking minimum wage would just go up. It would make everything better. No, it won't. And that's what people don't understand. Listen, I'm all for a guy getting 30, 40 an hour. Who gives a fuck? But here's the reality. The reality is, let's say Delaware, let's say the average median income is 50,000. Okay. Anybody below like 40 is considered you know, poor or whatever the case may be. And let's say that the average apartment is 12 to 1800, 2000 a month. Now here's the thing. Most people, most people are going to work. Some people have careers, right? And then there's people that have average hourly jobs. But when your minimum wage is like $9 an hour, it's really hard because you have to make three times the fucking rent to rent a fucking apartment. And God forbid if you're, if you're, you're, you're fucking don't have any credit because all you've ever done is work minimum wage jobs. So it's very hard to get a place to live almost impossible. So let's say that they go from $9 an hour to 15 an hour. Well, that's great. But guess what happens right after that? The apartment price goes up. So you're not getting ahead. You're not going anywhere. You're standing in a circle jerking yourself off onto a light socket. It doesn't fucking work. So I've always said that if, if you want income to be fair, then you have to restrict it sometimes. You have to look at what the national or at least have something implemented where there's a point credit system where, okay, you know what? If, if Johnny over here is making, you know, 75 an hour, you know, blah, 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 blah. But if you have Peter who really works two jobs, let's say he works two jobs, you know, and let's say that that totals 18 an hour totaling both jobs. Even at 18 an hour, he can't afford the $2,000 a month fucking apartment. And that's, that's the fucking problem. And that's why a lot of people get involved in crime because I know a lot of people in my life and I'm just going to, and then we'll be done with the show today. I didn't even mean to go this far, but let me just give you a scenario. Okay. Scenario is a guy gets involved with the wrong people. Okay. He makes a serious fucking mistake. And sometimes it is a mistake, you know, uh, after a certain point, though, you can't call it a mistake. You did dumb shit. That I think we could all agree on. But so this guy goes to prison. He serves his sentence. He does his time. But society says, nope, you're not worth shit no more. You're never going to work again. Plus, society wants to label you this, that, and the third. And I get it. If you stole a million dollars from a bank, a bank's probably not going to hire you. I get that. But there's no emphasis on the crime itself. There's no emphasis on what you actually did. They just have that box. Check that felon box. The minute they see that, well, we're going to move past him. Especially retail. If, if you got any kind of theft felonies on your record for anything, you're never going to get a retail job in your life. It's not going to happen. They're not going to hire you. 
which is illegal, but it's their prerogative. So a guy goes to jail, loses his family. His wife leaves him because he got into trouble. Now he's got alimony. He's got to pay child support. And he can't get a fucking job. Maybe he gets lucky and he finds a dishwashing job that's going to underpay him because they know he's a felon. And they'd rather, you know, they'll hire him for less money, but he's not going to bitch because he wants a job. So he works his fingers till they fucking bleed only to get goddamn nowhere. He gets nowhere. He's not getting his head above water. He can't pay rent. He can barely pay fucking child support. So what do they do? Oh, they're going to suspend his license, throw him in jail because he can't pay it. Great. So you take the one thing that he does need to drive to work and you take that away from him. So let's, what if he works 40 miles away? And that's the only job he's ever found that he can have because of his past. So you're going to take his license away from him. And yeah, that makes sense. Handicap him. And you know why they do that? To teach him a lesson about paying. Well, you want me to work. I'm trying to get a fucking job. Now you just took my license, forcing me to drive illegally, which you know I'm going to get caught for eventually. And right back to jail I go. That's how it works. They don't want you to be a success. Once they put you into that system, your life is fucking over. Now, let me use an example because there's going to be some of you say, well, if, if, if you don't want that, don't commit a crime. So let me ask you something. Somebody who steals something, probably not a nice thing, versus somebody who rapes a fucking woman, right? There's a major difference, right? Or let's take somebody who steals something versus a guy who rapes children. There's a big difference in that category, right? Sure there is. But that box on a job application says felony. Doesn't say rapist, child molester, sex offender. Doesn't say any of that. It just says felony. I'm just telling you, the system's warped and it's not fair. But at the same time, I'm going to say this. You, when you get out of your jam, you got to do whatever you got to do. I don't blame anybody who goes to prison, comes out and does illegal shit for a year and a half to get themselves in a position. I did it myself, okay? I don't blame anybody that does that, but then you have to come to a crossroads where you got yourself out of the gutter, you got yourself out of the situation. Now the hard work begins. You have something to hold you in case. You don't know how, you do you guys really, you guys want to hear something? After I got in a lot of trouble, do you know that five years after everything was over and done with, and a thousand applications later, 200 job interviews. No, 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 no. Didn't want to hear about my circumstance. Didn't want to hear about what I actually did or what the case was. Because I'm not one to sit there and say, but I didn't do it. I come pull out the fucking gate. This is what I did. I put guilty to it. You know what? Stupid thing to do. I was immature. I was selfish. I was greedy. I was wrong i was violent i was evil whatever the fucking case you want to be nobody's going to hire you nobody gives a fuck and if they do they're going to underpay you and then what are you going to do they're going to listen i'm going to tell you a story i had a guy who owned a, a greek restaurant he wasn't a greek guy he was a cocksucker this motherfucking prick i go and i get a dishwashing job i had to have something i had to have income so I'm working and I'm grinding and I work my way up from a dishwasher to a prep cook and all of this stuff. And now I'm running the fucking restaurant. I'm, I'm fucking hiring people. And this prick was underpaying me. He never gave me a W-2. He would come in every work, every, every Friday, he'd go into his little fucking office. He'd count out cash and he'd walk out and he'd come out and hand me cash. But he took taxes out. He took taxes out, but I didn't do a W-2. So finally, I'm like, you know what? He's not, he, he says he's taking the tax out, <coughs> but I know good goddamn well what's going to happen. First of all, he was underpaying me, but he knew I was a felon. So it's either take this or take nothing. But yet he's taking money out of my check every week. And I know at the end of the year, when it comes tax time, guess what? I'm going to be fucked or I'm getting paid totally under the table. Now, if I'm getting paid under the table, you cocksucker, you ain't taking money out of my check for tax. You follow me? 
So this went on for months and months and months. And I had all these responsibilities and I was, listen, I was very grateful the guy hired me, but then it came down to a fucking principal. And what he had done was he installed cameras and microphones into the whole entire restaurant. So now he's eavesdropping on fucking everybody's conversations. Well, I got a problem with that too. So I had had a bad day. I come in, I'm there at 6 a.m., blah, blah, blah. By like three o'clock, I'm fucking spent. I've got orders coming in and I've got shipments coming in and I've got to like, I'm I'm just doing a lot of stuff, making pizza, doing the thing. And I bitched to somebody, said, listen, he ever give you a W-2? He goes, no, he's been paying me under the table for years. And I said, what is he paying you? What is he paying you an hour? And I said, you've been here five years. What is he paying you, you know, per hour? He's like eight bucks. He was making 25 cents more than me. And this prick was taking money out of his check. And you know where that money was going? Right up his ass, up his nose and in his pocket. And you know how I know that? Because the IRS came in and fucking audited the restaurant. They opened the fucking goddamn cash register. It took all the cash out. And now I'm fucking hot. So he overheard me. And he comes out and he says, hey, do me a favor. Can you stay extra tonight? I want to talk to you at the end of the night. And he knew I, he knew I wasn't one to fuck with. And he knew I was pissed. I'm going to tell you what happened. God is my witness. True story. Everybody leaves. We lock the front door. We sit down. He goes, hey, you want a drink? I'm thinking, okay, he's going to butter me up for some shit. We're talking, you know, drink, whatever. He says, listen. He says, you know, I owe a lot of money to the government and, you know, I, I don't like doing business this way, but it's just what I got to do. And I said, uh, uh, hold on a second. I said, I've been here X, Y, and Z amount of time. You've taken $3,000 out of my pay. Where the fuck is that going? Well, I mean, listen, when we do taxes, it's going to, and he wouldn't even look at me when he said it. So the fact that the IRS came in and was like taking money out the fucking register told me this, this guy was up to no good, up to no good. So I says, you know what? I said, listen, not for nothing. So I think I've had enough time here. You know, I appreciate you giving me a job and, and you looked out for me. And, you know, I appreciate it. I said, but uh, I'm going to come here Friday. And if you don't have my $4,000, I'm going to crack your fucking head open in front of everybody in a midday uh, lunch rush. And he just kind of looked at me. I says, if you think I'm fucking playing, go ahead and try me. So on Friday, so I walk out, he begs me, no, 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 you know, listen, we don't have to do it this way. I don't want to get police involved. The minute he said cops, I knew I was going to crack him. That was it. So come Friday, I go in, he's suddenly not around the restaurant. This prick is there every fucking day. Now he's disappeared. So I wait and I wait and I wait. I check in every couple of weeks. Don't ever see him. So finally I decide one night, I'm like, you know what? He's probably closing tonight. I'm going to wait outside. There was a little alleyway that was adjacent to the fucking, to the back door of the restaurant. So I parked my car down the block, walked into this little alleyway. And when you walk out of the alleyway, you can see who's coming out the door. So I waited and I waited till he came out the door and I cracked him harder with a pipe than you've ever seen anybody crack anybody. And he didn't see it coming and I cracked him good. And then I went in his pockets and I took all his fucking money. Fuck him. That's the way I do business. And this isn't a tough guy thing. This is a, you do not take advantage of people. And he had around like, I don't know, 3,500, which is what he owed me anyway. And I told him, don't ever fuck over anybody in this place again, because I'll come in here and crack you on top of because of somebody else. Anybody complains to me, you do this again. I'm going to come back. And that was it. I never saw the motherfucker again. As a matter of fact, somebody recently told me that uh, he still owns the joint. But he's passing out W-2s now. He learned his lesson, right? So that's my principle, is you can get pushed into a situation where somebody thinks they can get over on you. They could take advantage of the situation because you made mistakes. And that's bullshit. And that's the lesson. That's the lesson. Just be square. Because if you're not going to be square, bad shit's going to happen. <coughs> so we'll probably do the waterfront one more time next week, and that'll be it. And we'll move on to the biographies and stuff like that. So in the meantime... Have a great weekend, and uh, I'm going to get out of here, I think, and uh, I don't know what I'm going to do this weekend. I'd like to be left the fuck alone, I can tell you that. If my phone didn't ring another motherfucking time this weekend, I would be a happy fuck. All right, so take it easy, everybody, and we'll be back next week with an all-new show.